plenty of Moogs in there. Or, or, or it's not, you don't say it's not Robert Moog. It's Robert, do you know how to pronounce his name? Moog. Robert Moog. Never knew that. <laughs> Moog is in vogue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't find me every day. <laughs> experience electronic music and it made an impact on me acid tracks by future in a pub um, near Twickenham it was an all dayer I think Simon Dunmore who now runs Defected was organizing a party and um, there was two rooms and I remember there was a boy dancing to this record he was one of my jazz dance boys and he was dancing to acid house and I was disturbed by this because I was like oh my god um, I thought he was on sort of my side of uh, the dance floor and he was dancing in the acid house room and then I thought then I, that's when I really listened to that song properly and it was an incredible kind of moment for me so that was my most um, um, important um, electronic moment I'd say. Mine's probably way less um, credible and um, later. <laughs> credible, tweet them. But, but uh, probably just this dance stuff that was got into the charts because the only way that you'd hear music when I was a kid was watching Top of the Pops or the chart show uh, and so yeah just like sort of early hardcore stuff that got into the charts which was generally like the silly poppy end. I remember like there was a really good uh, like rave version of Rainbow on the word once theme from Rainbow, not particularly. So you got introduced for you were Happy Hardcore, yeah. that was your introduction? Well, not really, not even like Happy, it wasn't like going out and buying tape packs or anything, but just like that. The what year are we like, talking about? 1989 or so, I guess, 1990, I was like 10. You're that young. Well, that's what that was what was on TV. Where were you in 1988? I was at, uh, <laughs> probably playing football in the garden. <laughs> Brilliant. You look older. Thanks. You've got so much knowledge. You picked up in that time, yeah, right? I guess so. For me, what was interesting was that when I was doing Dingwalls, which was an interesting afternoon session in Camden every Sunday, um, what was good about that was, and that was like between sort of 86 and 1990, so it kind of just surfed over the whole Acid House period, pre and post. And so what I thought was quite interesting was that, you know, you'd get on a Sunday afternoon, all the ravers who'd been to a shum coming to Dingles in the afternoon, coming still on the buzz from the night before. You know, it was, it became, it was the sort of after party in a way. And um, and so it was quite interesting to see, you know, Fabio and Groove Rider would come down, Bookham would come down. This is because they were, to be honest with you, all those DJs, they're all jazz funk jazz heads. They're all jazz, Carl Cox, they're all jazz funk, because that was what it was. It was jazz funk and soul and a bit of disco and house as it was coming in. But really, they all came because they're all old enough to have basically been brought up on the London scene of Crackers and, and you know, Paul Anderson and, and the, that, you know, Radio and Victor. That was our kind of, you know, Robbie Vincent on a Saturday and a bit of Greg Edwards on a Saturday night. That was it. Another person, sorry to go on, is Nicky Holloway. Nicky Holloway, I don't, I don't, I never read anything about him. And Nicky Holloway, without Nicky Holloway, there was no scene. There was no scene. He was the one who went out and organised the one-off parties. He created mailing lists. He went and went to Ibiza, weird places, just to, you know, he created a movement which led to Shum, which led to, you know, all this, to Acid House. You know, if it hadn't been for Nicky Holloway, there would have been no holiday to Ibiza. There would have been no sort of experience of, of you know, of the legendary Ibiza clubs and DJs. And, you know, it would be a different history now. So I think he's somebody who, again, was prepared to put on events for more than 200 people, for a thousand people where he would play electronic music. I, I, to be honest with you, whenever, when, when people were saying that super clubs are dying, I was like celebrating, you know, it was great. It was great. I mean, because in a way, you know, it's a bit like Ibiza today. You know, that's the lowest common denominator. It needs to reinvent itself. And that's what is so brilliant about living here in the UK, because there's always going to be some punk, some rebel who's going to want to switch it up and change the machine up. And that's why we always get these amazing new musical variations. With Alex coming in, he just showed me there was another layer, two layers be below, further away, deeper than why, where I was at in terms of sort of new producers coming through, which is why we created the Electric series on, on the label, really. Yeah. We should have called it Electronic, shouldn't we? Yeah. Brands with Electronic. Electric, it almost feels like it should be sort of, you know, the Headhunters or something, in a way, but it works, looking back. 
I'd like to look back at the tracks from the first two or three because, you know, he was on a mission with it and it was, it was amazing for us because, you know, of course, a lot of the artists that he was already discovering and sharing were really early days of their careers and so they were just happy to get any kind of exposure. So from a record label point of view, it wasn't particularly complicated to license all of this music. It was just about knowing about it. But it was all a bit... We've got Mount Kimby on there. Yeah. Yeah, first on Mount Kimby. Forget Marianne Hobbs on Mount Kimby, right? By the way. No, it was far too left. That was far too jazzy. Wasn't it? <laughs>